The code that we have written is, as I pointed out already, a complete code that can be used to solve real problems, or as real as the assumption of a two-dimensional flow allows for. Before a numerical code can be used to solve problems, it is, however, necessary to gain some familiarity with how it works and how accurate the solution can be expected to be. Here we test the code on three problems. First, we examine a falling drop, similar to the problems used to test the code, except with a larger density difference. We then examine a rising bubble, which can be set up by simply switching the material parameters. And then we simulate the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, where a heavy fluid falls into a lighter one. The last one requires minor changes in the code to account for the different interface shape. In numerical simulation, it's often convenient to work with parameters of the order of unity or as close to unity as possible. Thus, a square computational domain is of dimension 1 by 1, density is 1, and so on. We often refer to these values as computational units. To compare with physical values and experimental results, we use the appropriate non-dimensional numbers. Those can often be thought of as representing the ratio of forces, length scales, or time scales, and any introductory fluid dynamics textbook has extended discussions of those. Here, we only list a few of those that often show up in simulations of multiphase or interfacial flows. We start with the falling drop. We have already presented results for a falling drop using a 32 by 32 grid. Here we will look at that problem again, but to make it slightly more interesting, we increase the ratio of the density of the drop to the ambient fluid by 10. Although many multiphase flows are found in high-pressure environments where the density of air is much higher than at atmospheric density, many experimental studies are done under atmospheric conditions. Thus, high density ratios are often of relevance. For the falling drop, the diameter of the drop, its density and gravity, surface tension and viscosity, as well as the density and viscosity of the ambient fluid, completely specify the problem. Sometimes the density and viscosity of the ambient fluid play smaller roles, particularly if the drop falls only a short distance. Generally, the evolution also depends on time. Notice that we include gravity multiplied by the density difference, since that is the effective buoyancy force. Taking the drop diameter, the drop density, and gravity multiplied by the density difference as the repeated variables, we find that the problem is governed by two non-dimensional numbers, the ratios of the densities and the viscosities and times. The results, also made non-dimensional by the repeated variables, are therefore a function of these numbers. Thus, the velocity of the drop, represented by the fruit number, or velocity divided by the density difference, gravity, and the drop diameter, is a function of the Eckler's number and the Archimedes number, the density and viscosity ratios, and for unsteady problems, it's also a function of the appropriately non-dimensionalized time. Before moving on, we note that the importance of non-dimensional numbers goes far beyond just allowing us to run our simulation in any units we fancy. Often they can help us to identify limiting cases where we can ignore certain effects, thus simplifying our studies. For drops, it's often found that the effect of viscosity are small once the Archimedes number is high enough, at least for short enough time. Thus, we would expect that once our n is high enough so that the results have stopped changing, we do not need to increase it further. Since computing very low viscosity can be difficult, or at least time-consuming, this simplifies our study. Similar observations can be made about surface tension, particularly once it is high enough. Except for the density and viscosity of the ambient gas, we use the parameters used already. Those are specified at the beginning of the code. Thus, Lx and Ly are 1, Gx is 0, but Gy is negative 100, the density of the ambient fluid is 0 0.1, and the drop density is 2. Similarly, the viscosity of the ambient fluid is 0 0.01, and the drop viscosity is 0 0.2. Surface tension is 10, the tangent velocities on all four boundaries are zero. The drop radius is 0 0.15, and it's initially located at x equal to 0 0.5 and y equal to 0 0.7. We start by using a grid with 32 by 32 pressure control volumes and a time step of 0 0.01. We'll follow the solution for 200 time steps or up to time 0 0.2. For the pressure equation, we specify an error of 0 0.01, but we also set the maximum number of iterations to 200. For a 32 by 32 grid, the code runs fast enough so that it can be run interactively and the drop observed as it falls. The evolution is very similar to what we saw earlier for the lower density ratio. The drop deforms slightly as it falls, flattens as it collides with the wall, rebounds slightly and then settles on the wall. 
If we do everything correctly, we expect the numerical solution to be an approximation to an exact solution of the governing equations. At this point, however, we do not know how accurate our solution is, or, for that matter, if it is correct. Assuming that our code runs, there are two main reasons that the answer may not be correct. The first is programming errors, and the second is numerical errors. Our goal is to eliminate the first and understand the second. For the first part, it is convenient to work with benign parameters, such as a small density ratio and modest values of viscosity and surface tension, where we are reasonably certain that we will not run into any numerical difficulties. If we have an analytical solution, then we can of course compare the results with it. In most cases, an analytic solution is, however, only applicable for simple special situations, such as a spherical drop in stroke flow that only tests part of the code. In many cases, we can use a technique called the method of manufactured solutions, and although it's a great way to check codes, it's a bit of an overkill here. Thus, we are limited to a relatively modest number of things to check. First of all, does the solution look correct? If it does not, the probability of an error is far higher than that we have discovered an unexpected behavior. Secondly, if the, is the solution as symmetric as we expect it to be? What about if we let gravity point in the opposite direction, or to the left or right? Does the solution still look the same? Finally, does the solution converge under grid refinement, where we change both the spatial and the temporal resolution? If we are using benign parameters, it should converge quickly. For the codes that we have presented so far, we have done each of these tests for the falling dropper. While checking the code for errors is usually a one-time task, examining the convergence must be done for every new problem that we simulate. Before doing that for the falling drop problem, we need to decide how we evaluate convergence. Looking at the velocity and the marker function and how they evolve in time is certainly the first step, where we usually desire a more quantitative description of the evolution. Such description is not only useful to assess the convergence as the numerical parameters such as the grid resolutions are varied, but also to describe how the solution changes as the physical parameters are changed. The diagnostic variables, or the quantities of interest, can be defined in several ways, but for our purpose we focus only on the simplest one, such as the area of the drop and the location and velocity of its centroids. For our problem, we know that the volume, or area in our case, should be conserved since the flow is incompressible. We also expect the centroid of the drop in the horizontal direction to remain unchanged. Thus, these are two obvious quantities to monitor. The centroid in the vertical direction does obviously change, but it's also an obvious quantity to monitor, as is the centroid velocity. Thus, here we will examine how the drop area and the location and velocity of the centroids evolve with time. These quantities can be computed in different ways, but here we integrate over the interface. The droplet volume is defined as the volume integral of the interior of the drop. In two dimensions this is an area integral, and to convert it into an integral over the surface of the drop we first know that the unity can be written as half the divergence of the position vector, that is, the x derivative of x plus the y derivative of y is 2. Using the divergence theorem, the volume integral can now be written as a surface integral. Notice that we could have used either the x derivative of the horizontal component or the y derivative of the vertical component, but using the average avoid biasing the results in either direction. The centroid of the drop is defined as the volume integral of the position vector divided by the volume, and the volume integral can be rewritten as a surface integral by recognizing that the position vector is half the divergence of a vector whose components are the coordinates squared. The centroid velocity, defined as the average velocity of the drop, can be computed by simply taking the time derivative of the centroid location. It can also be found as a surface integral, but generally we find that to be less accurate, particularly for low resolutions. The total interface length, or surface area in three dimension, is also an important quantity of interest since it's directly related to the surface energy. This can be found in a straightforward way. In the current code, we collect the various diagnostics as the code runs, so we need to add a few lines to do that at the end of the time loop. We also have included a few commands to plot these quantities as well as to save them under a different name. This is usual when we are doing grid refinement or parameter studies and want to rerun the code several times and compare the results. The top three frames show the front, the velocity field, and the marker function for three different resolutions. 32 by 32, 64 by 64, and 128 by 128, 
bridge at time 0.2 when the droplets collided with the wall and rebounded slightly. Although the droplet shape is similar in all three frames, it's also obvious that there are slight differences, particularly between the first two frames. The three plots at the bottom show the area of the drop, the distance of the drop centroid from the bottom wall, and the centroid velocity versus time for all three runs. The black line is for the lowest resolution, and the red line is for the finest one. On the coarsest grid, the drop loses a little bit of mass, particularly when it first collides with the wall, but overall the results agree well, particularly for the two finest grids. Our code is, at least in principle, capable of solving a wide range of problems involving two immiscible fluids. It is, however, not written as a multi-purpose code, so in most cases we need to change the code to do a new problem. The simplest change is to examine bubbles or light drops instead of heavy drops. To do so, we only need to change the material properties so that buoyancy drives the bubbles upwards instead of down. We change the top of the file to modify the material parameters. The density of the ambient fluid is 2 and the bubble density is 0.05. Similarly, the viscosity of the ambient fluid is 0.1 and the bubble viscosity is 0.005. Surface tension is 10 and gravity is minus 100 as for the simulations of the drop. In addition, we make the computational domain taller so that the bubbles can, can rise for a longer distance. The tangent velocity of all four boundaries are zero. The bubble radius is 0.15 and it's initially located at x equal to 0.5 and y equal to 0.3. We start by using a grid with 32 by 64 pressure control volumes and a time step of 0.0125. We will follow the solution for 400 steps or up to time 0.5. For the pressure equation, we specify an error of 0.01 and set the maximum number of iterations to 200 as before. The bubble moves upward due to buoyancy, staying more or less spherical, quickly reaching a steady state velocity and leaving a significant wake. As it reaches the top, it flattens slightly. We again repeat the simulation on three grids and the top three frames show the front, the velocity field and the marker function for three different resolutions, 32 by 64, 64 by 128 and 128 by 256 grids at time 0.5 when the bubble has collided with the top wall. Although the bubble shape is similar in all three frames, it's also obvious that there are slight differences, particularly between the first two frames. The three plots on the bottom show the area of the bubble, the distance of the bubble centroid from the bottom wall, and the centroid velocity versus time for all three runs. The black line is for the lowest resolution, and the red line is for the finest one. The mass conservation here is obviously not as good as for the drop, where we had to expand the vertical axis to see the difference between the different resolutions. It does, however, improve with increasing resolution, and there are only minor differences in the curves for the centroid location and the velocities for the two finest grid. The mixing of two fluids, as a heavy fluid initially placed above a lighter one falls down and the light fluid rises, is a classical problem in computations of multifluid flows. Computationally, it's very simple. We put the heavy fluid in the top part of the domain and perturb the interface to initiate the motion. Experimentally, it's more complex. In some cases, the heavy and the light fluids are initially separated by a membrane, which is removed as quickly as possible. But in other cases, the heavy fluid initially at the bottom of a container that is accelerated downwards using devices ranging from rubber bands to rocket motors. To simulate the evolution of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, we need to make minor changes in the code. The interface does, in particular, no longer enclose an isolated blob, but extends from the left to the right boundary. We will assume that the evolution is symmetric and that the side walls can be taken to be full slip walls. This allows us to assume that the slope of the interface at the side walls is zero, which simplifies the implementation of the boundary conditions for the front. Making the vertical walls full slips is a very minor change. We want the shear stress there to be zero, so the velocity gradient is zero, and this is accomplished by putting the tangent velocity at the ghost points equal to the first tangent velocity inside the domain. The changes to the front are also relatively simple. Instead of forming a closed circle, it now stretches across the domain from the left to right. We need to decide exactly how we handle the endpoints, 
And here we use ghost point so that the first point is outside the domain and the left boundary falls between the first and the second point. The right boundary is handled in the same way. Changes in the code are minor. First of all, we need to modify the physical and numerical parameters at the beginning of the code. We take LX to be 1 and LY to be 2 as for the bubble simulations. GX is 0, but GY is negative 100. The density of the heavy fluid at the top is 4, and the density of the light fluid at the bottom is 1. Similarly, the viscosity of the heavy fluid is 0 0.05, and the viscosity of the light fluid is 0 0.01. Surface tension is 5. The tangent velocities on the top and bottom boundaries are 0. We start by using a grid with 32 by 64 pressure control volumes and a time step of 0 0.0125. We will follow the solution for 300 time steps or up to time 0.375. For the pressure equation, we specify an error of 0.01, but we also set the maximum number of iterations to 200. When we compute the relevant non-dimensional numbers, we will use the properties of the top fluid and take the width of the domain as a length scale. The initial conditions must be modified and we take the interface to run across the domain at y equal to 1.2 perturbing it with a cosine wave of amplitude 0.2. Here we have hard-coded the location and perturbation of the interface, but we could, of course, make those variables as we did for the droplet size and location. Then we change the code to deal with the new situation. We add a line putting the horizontal velocities of the first and the last front point inside the domain to zero to ensure that they do not drift outside the domain. After finding the velocity of the front points, we modify the line setting the value of the ghost points. On the side walls, we add a line to set the density at the ghost points equal to the density of the next interior point since the interface moves. This is not strictly needed since these points are not used, but they will look better when we plot the marker. We change the line where the ghost velocities on the vertical walls are specified to impose full slit walls. Before computing the diagnostic, we modify the line setting the ghost velocities for the front. And we modify the line setting the location of the front ghost points after we add and delete points. Finally, we modify the plotting slightly to plot the whole front. Here we show the evolution of the Rayleigh-Taylor instability as computed on a 32 by 64 grid. The initial growth of the perturbation is very slow, but then it speeds up. The light fluid rising upward is generally referred to as a bubble and the heavy fluid falling down as a spike. This terminology becomes increasingly precise as the density ratio increases but here, where the heavy fluid is four times denser than the light fluid, the evolution is more symmetric, at least at the early stages. As the spike falls, its nose first becomes flatter as the pressure in the light fluid resists its motion, and the rim is then pulled off by the light fluid rushing into the upward moving bubble. These arms develop very quickly and consist of a drop connected to the rest of the heavy fluid by a thin filament. They are, in particular, much smaller than the bubble or the main part of the downward falling spike. The Rayleigh-Taylor instability exemplifies a major challenge in simulations of multifluid and multiphase flows. While initially everything is well behaved and while it is easy to get a fully converged solution, at later time we see the formation of very small scale features that are much smaller than the scales in the initial conditions. These small-scale features are so small that a grid resolution that was perfectly fine before their formation is now totally insufficient. For the single-mode Rayleigh-Taylor instability, these are, except for very high viscosities, unavoidable. High surface tension can also suppress them, but if you make the surface tension too high, the interface becomes stable and the perturbation oscillates instead of growing. To check the convergence, we examine the solution at two times on three different grids, using 32 by 64, 64 by 128, and 128 by 256 pressure control volume inside the domain. At the earlier time, in the top row, we see that the three different resolutions result in essentially identical solutions. At the later time, however, the differences are larger. The shape of the upward moving bubble is nearly the same, and so is the blunt disc-like shape moving down into the light fluid. The shape of the arms set from the rim of the heavy disk does, however, change with the resolution. This is a common problem in multiphase flow simulations. The flow often generates scales that are much smaller than the initial scales, and the smaller scale quickly become under-resolved. For fine enough grids, we do, of course, expect 
convergence since eventually viscosity and or surface tensions at smaller scales. But the fact that this can happen at order of magnitude smaller scales than the initial setup often makes it difficult to produce a fully resolved solution. Although we will not discuss the issue here, it is a major one and one that is currently being actively examined. We can quantify the evolution in several different ways, but here we do the simplest thing possible. In the top frame on the right, we plot the maximum and minimum of the interface versus time and see that those are essentially identical or all three grids. Below, we plot the total length of the interface versus time, and here we see that while the total lengths on the coarsest grids are similar, the finest grid results in shorter interface, as we expect from the interface shape shown on the left. The thorough testing of a numerical code has several purposes. First and foremost, we need to convince us, and often others, that the code is correct. Part of this can be done using benign parameters, where the solution should converge easily on a relatively coarse grid. This helps us establish that the method is correctly implemented, even if the method has difficulty with the initial conditions and the parameter values that we really want to simulate. A code that works for some parameter set also provides a path to manage more complex problems. We gradually change the physical parameters, and when we run into problems, we change the numerical parameters such as spatial and temporal resolution and the maximum iteration to see if we can get a solution. Even though a code has been tested thoroughly for one problem, it is usually necessary to repeat some of the tests when we apply it to a new problem to establish the convergence properties and to determine what resolution is necessary. 